The Skeleton of the Great Irish Giant, one. Conceived on the very top of a very high haystack in Littlebridge, County Derry, by his stout, strong-voiced mother and his average-sized father, Charles Byrne grew like a cornstalk and was the talk of London for years. Could be seen at the sign of the Hampshire Hog for half a crown or one shilling for children and servants in livery. He too had a voice that sounded like thunder, but his appearance was far from wholesome. He constantly dribbled and spat. Out of fashion, his savings stolen, his limbs always aching, and his drinking killing him surely, the surgeons gathered around the house where he lay like harpooners round a whale. How he feared their hunger for him. When he died, the fisherman he had employed to sink his leaded body twenty fathoms down and out of reach, succumbed to the bribes, handed the huge corpse over for five hundred pounds. In his Earl's Court menagerie laboratory, John Hunter, foremost of those surgeons and a true scientist, cut the Irish giant into chunks and boiled him in a great copper kettle. Water plumping, he kept the Irish giant bubbling and simmering for days, fat skimmed off the top, prepared the skeleton to hang in his own famous museum. Disappointingly, the hung frame, the articulated bones, measured in at only seven feet and seven inches, not the eight feet four the Irish giant and his manager had fraudulently claimed, and furthermore he wasn't the last of his kind. There was the other Irish giant and the gigantic twin brothers who were also natives of Ireland. Still, his skeleton was a popular exhibit in the Hunterian and remains there, an impressive sight even to this day. Two. What? Bones can't speak. We are all dumb here in Mr Hunter's marvellous collection of morbid anatomy, curiosities and human misery. Silent as a grave, we hang or float in our limbo of glass cases and jars of formaldehyde, darkness forbidden to us, constantly on show. We are the blunt truths of the flesh. What further story do you expect from me or my twisted companion bought for 85 guineas, Mr Jaffs, with his fibrodysplasia ossifens progressiva? Or from all the unnamed, the sliced and the hacked, from the part of the face of a child with smallpox, from the penis and bladder of a small boy, the skull of an old woman who has lost all her teeth, the breast with a large carcinoma, the rectum with haemorrhoids, the femur fractured by gunshot, the fetuses, the vagina, the femoral artery, expendable, all of us, voiceless in death as in life, we serve to illustrate what... Familiar, so strange and beautiful, little mummified falcon, all wrapped up and laying in the corner of the display case. I watch you wheel in the sky that is the same sky, beneath the sun that is the same sun, your wings lean on the wind. And it is as if I have always known you on my wrist, and you have hunted for me in that life, as you will hunt for me in the next. Becoming an ascetic. It was Diogenes, the cynic, who suggested it to me. The barrel showed me the very one, a wine cask, oak and iron, made by a skilled cooper, a thing of beauty in itself and capable of holding me. I climb down inside, crouch. The curve fits my spine perfectly. My legs a tent, knees against my chest, When I lift my head, stretch my neck back and look up, I see that stars and daylight also shine. Advice written on the occasion of a friend's 50th birthday. Harden your heart. Don't try to work out who was wrong and who was right. Take your pleasure where you can find it. Say little and do not let anyone know what you really think. If you don't like someone, stay away from them. Oh, nothing. Don't concern yourself with understanding yourself. It serves no useful purpose. 
have no animals. When they die, you will just get upset. Regard everyone with suspicion, take nothing for granted, not even the evidence of your own eyes. Do not talk to the dead, particularly those who visit in dreams. They rarely tell the truth and are too fond of unnecessary symbolism. Remember, intuition is a useful tool, but it is not infallible. Don't join Facebook or play online bingo. Nurture a liking for American cop series and don't worry if you weep at the most random of things. Keep up appearances when you go out. It's amazing how a face can pull itself together for a social occasion. Self-medicate. Solar Lanterns As night falls, they hold a vestige of the sun. Enough to shine among the gardens lit green, like candles lit for safe return. Like the candles I have lit in churches and cathedrals, city and towns I happen to be tourist in. Struck against my unbelief and for my dead. Just little lights, not much against the dark. Hogarth, Self-Portrait with Pug, Dublin, 2007. Who is this? And what is she doing here, like a distorting mirror? Looking at me as if I am not me, but her. A different time, but still with my pug beside me. And still gin lane, the four stages, the marriage a la mode. I've been kind to myself, but she knows how it is. Outside it is raining, and as the needle disappears into the grey sky, the same things are happening that have always happened and nothing is so black and white that it is not lived in vividness. I'm only part of this, and so is she, and those she's with, the figures beside her, behind her, inside her, jostling, casting a shadow backwards to what lies before us all. And the whole line up of us knows it's about flesh, its influence, the demands it makes upon us, its hungers and requirements, how it makes us who we are, despite our desire to be something lighter. It holds us to ourselves. Ballast to our souls, vain blood looks through. Balloon What an absolutely wonderful day. I was dressed, of course, for the occasion, a new dress, the bodice cut low to show my magnificent breast to best advantage and the silk, a deep red to complement the swags of heavier silk that draped the wicker gondola. So in we clambered, Mr Lunardi, young Mr Biggin, the old Etonian, and me, Mrs Sage, actress and first ever aerial female. There was a teensy problem then. Mr Lunardi had been too much the gentleman to inquire how much I weighed, so had miscalculated. Gallantly, he exited the basket, leaving it light enough to rise and leaving me and the lovely, rich young man to soar without him. I had to get down on all fours to do up the gondola's lacing, so I am afraid the people of Piccadilly had a view of my large but rather delectable bottom. Lord knows what they thought I was doing, and gorgeous George, we were on first name terms by then, did get rather overwrought, I couldn't help but notice. Then, of course, I trod on the barometer, so we couldn't actually tell what heights we'd reached. But other than that, well, we had a simply wonderful time. We had Italian sparkling wine and cold chicken and called to the people below through a speaking trumpet. The views were magnificent and I had no need whatsoever of my smelling salts. We landed at Harrow on the Hill in an unharvested hayfield. Unfortunately, the farmer was a complete savage, yelling and swearing most inappropriately and accusing us of ruining his crop. Thankfully, we were rescued by a delightful young gentleman from Harrow School who, as I'd hurt a tendon in my foot, carried me to the local tavern where we all got wonderfully drunk. I did hear that in Mr Biggin's London club there was a deal of speculation as to what else we might have engaged in up there in the heavens. Cries of, did he board her? That's men for you. I suppose that when I go out now I shall be much looked at 
as if a native of the aerial regions had come down to pay an earthly visit. Youth Riding after Picasso I will both remember and forget how easy it is and how light I am. The smell of the trodden earth in the big ring, sweat and perfume of the crowd. It was never just an act. See me, my hair flowing behind me, my body obliviously balanced on the moment's broad back. Dissolution of the Circus After the last of the big cats died, toothless and emaciated, the elephant was impounded by animal welfare and the ponies were sold to a riding school where they soon forgot all their tricks. The bearded lady had electrolysis, married the fat man who joined a gym and was less than half the man he used to be. The clown enrolled with the Open University, English Literature and Philosophy, and the contortionist gave up cocaine, finally straightened out his head. There's only the two of us left now, me and the ringmaster with his top hat and his whip, and though the spangles have mostly fallen off my costume, I can still balance up there on the wire. <laughs>